Well, I figure this would be true. If you've only heard one sermon from Daniel chapter 8, then you have never heard a sermon from Daniel chapter 11. And you'll see it's quite a chapter, if ever there was one. Tonight we're going to be in Daniel chapter 11. We're going through the book of Daniel a chapter at a time. We're trying to look at it in chronological order. And if you thought you knew how to count, you don't. 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 5, 6, 11, 10, 12, 9 is the apparent chronological order of Daniel. So we've made it to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 is chock full of predictive prophecy. And that is from Daniel's perspective. Predictive prophecy is one of, if not the strongest cases for the inspiration of the Bible. And if the Bible is inspired, then it is God-breathed and therefore it is authoritative. But the problem that kind of comes along with predictive prophecy is, and that is prophecy in general, really, is that many times these prophecies can be misapplied. And when they're misapplied, sometimes people teach false doctrine from these predictive prophecies that God never had in mind. For example, there is no such thing as premillennialism on the pages of Scripture. You may not know what that is, but it's the rapture. But many times, false teachers will use chapters like Daniel 11, really the whole book of Daniel from one perspective, and try to use them as proof texts for their false doctrine when that is not the meaning of the text. Daniel chapter 11 is exceedingly historical. Daniel chapter 11 is difficult from our perspective, not because we're waiting for any of these prophecies to be fulfilled, but because many of the fulfillments of these prophecies occurred in that period between the Testaments. Now, you should already know from the book of Daniel that as it starts out, Babylon is the head of gold. Babylon was the reigning world power. But by the time we finish chapter 5, Babylon had already fallen to the Medes and the Persians. So the Medes and the Persians are still technically in power in chapter 11. And really that remains that way throughout the end or the close of the Old Testament. Nehemiah, Malachi, somewhere in there was the last book of the Old Testament to be written and the Persians were still in power. But if you recall from Daniel's prophecies, that's not where it stopped, is it? The Greeks came into power after the Medes and the Persians. A lot of what we read about in Daniel 11 is about the Greeks and their reign happened in that 400 year period of divine silence. The intertestamental period that occurred after Nehemiah or Malachi and before John the Baptist came out of the wilderness preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But that's not where Daniel ended either, is it? He also talked about Rome, which when we open the New Testament, we can see that Rome is in power. And perhaps to some degree, with the exception of Babylon, you'll see the Medes and the Persians, you'll see the Greeks, and some will say you even see Rome in this chapter, but we'll give it a quick study and see what we can find. Does that sound like fun? Oh, it'll be just a blast, I'm sure. Four things we want to do tonight. Three of them will come from the chapter. We'll take the Holy Spirit's outline and try to section it up in ways that we can understand it, bite-sized pieces at a time, and then we'll make some applications. So let's, keep, let's begin. Here's the first thing. In Daniel 11, verses 1 through 19, we're going to see the conflicts. And tonight's sermon, perhaps you'll see why, is entitled, The King of the North. But in Daniel 11, verses 1 through 4, let's see the division. Daniel 11 and verse 1. The text says, Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Well, the first question should be is, Who's I? Who is I? Well, in this instance... You'd almost need to go back into chapter 10 from the way it's laid out and figure out that this I is some type of a heavenly being. Perhaps it is an angel. And it seems that throughout this entire chapter, this is a heavenly being, perhaps an angel, who is revealing this to Daniel. 
But Daniel was obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit at some time after this literally occurred to record it supernaturally by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and therefore it is infallible. Daniel is the writer of this entire book. Every word of it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 7 and verse 1, chapter 12 and verse 4 proves that. But look at what it says. Also I, some type of heavenly being, perhaps an angel, in the first year of Darius the Mead, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Here's a prime example. The Bible simply gives us the fact. It does not tell us exactly how this heavenly being, perhaps an angel, strengthened and confirmed Darius the Mede. Perhaps it was by means of words. Perhaps it was by some other means which we don't really know about because we're outside of the age of the supernatural. My view is we're not going to spend too much time on that. Verse number two. And now will I show thee the truth. Can you argue with that? I don't believe you, but you can. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. Do you really want me to bore you with their name? Because I can barely say them. And I don't take it personally, but I'm not so sure that you would spell them right because I'm not sure I can even say them right. So we're not going to call these guys names, okay? Is that fair? Good, you with me? And the fourth shall be far richer than they all. I am going to call this one's name because he is in the Bible. He is in the book of Esther, chapter 1, and he is known as Ahasuerus. If you don't know how to say that or spell it, turn to Esther, chapter 1, and you'll, you'll see it there. But I think historically, most of us would probably know this man as Xerxes. So the fourth king of Persia, who's going to be far richer than they all, we know him as Xerxes. Ahasuerus, he's called, and that's his title perhaps, in the book of Esther, chapter 1. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Now keep this in its context. This heavenly being, most likely an angel, says there's three kings of Persia. You can't deny that. There's going to be a fourth far richer than them all. You can't deny that. And this fourth one is going to stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So when we look at this chapter, Persia and Greece is in the context. And really, if you do your homework and look at the historical accuracy of this chapter, it is utterly amazing because Daniel covers a period of no less than 350 years. How did he do that? We had an angel tell him. It seems like. How did the angel know? He came from heaven. So he was not bound by time just like God in eternity is not bound by time. Verse number three. Here's a, here's a key of predictive prophecy. This is what makes it so difficult. You can skip, or the prophets, or the speaker, however you want to look at it, skips hundreds of years in the matter of just a few verses. Because, and a mighty king shall stand up. Now this seems to be regarding the realm of Grecia. This mighty king you know is Alexander the Great. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Look at verse 4. And when he, this is the mighty king who is most likely Alexander the Great. When he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. From Daniel chapter 8, we realize that after Alexander's death, Greece went into a period of turmoil and four of his generals are the ones who reigned it back under control. And we called their names Cassander, Lysimachus, and all those under wonderful names. So we're not going to call their names again. Because I think you have an idea of what's going on here. Now, in Daniel 11, verses 5 through 12, let's see the discord. And here's where things get interesting. The king of the south. Now, this holds true throughout this whole chapter. But it is not the same king of the south every time. So instead of giving a bunch of historical names, which I probably can't pronounce right, and you probably can't spell right, which is on me, not you, 
The king of the south every time is Egypt. Surely we can understand that. And this is from the direction of Palestine. So the king of the south is not in every verse the same king, but it is the king of the south regarding Egypt. Alexander's generals, the one who took control of that, they, became, they came to be known as the Ptolemies, and that starts with a P, believe it or not. So if you want to look at it historically that way, trace the Ptolemies, and you'll see exactly how accurate this chapter is. But instead of getting bogged down in all that, the king of the south is Egypt. Surely we can remember that. Shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Now, the his in this verse probably refers back to Alexander. That's what makes things so difficult about this chapter. Now look at verse 6. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south, you know that's Egypt, shall come to the king of the north. Now, no doubt the king of the north in the various verses that we're going to keep reading is not the exact same man. But the king of the north is Syria. Every time. It is not necessarily the exact same person. But it is dealing with the same country if you would so choose to look at it that way. So this, the south is Egypt. The north is Syria. That would be the Seleucids if you would like to trace those down. And just instead of getting bogged down with all these things, look at what it says. And in the end of the years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her, in these times. Do a little bit of research and see how many different people are named there. But just consider it this way. This is marriage, divorce, and murder is what takes place. Marriage, divorce, not remarriage, marriage, divorce, and murder, historically speaking. Look at verse number seven. But out of a branch of her roots, go back and trace that down, shall one stand up in his estate or perhaps in his place which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, Syria, and shall deal against them and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Who is the north? The north is Syria. This is more historical murder and intrigue between Egypt and Syria. You could seriously... See four to five different historical characters in those verses. But know this, from Daniel's perspective, this is predictive prophecy. From our perspective, this is history. This already happened. Verse number eight, or verse number nine rather. So, and I think if you notice this and listen carefully, I'm reading from the King James. If you have the New King James, you'll see a big difference in these two verses. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. Now, what I would suggest to you here is when you look at your version of the Bible, what is italicized? If you see something that's in italics, that means it's added by the translators to help clarify the meaning. So just be careful when you see things like that. Again, if you're not reading the King James Version, you should probably see very clearly what I'm talking about, but look at what is italicized. And that's another thing that makes predictive prophecy so difficult. Now, look at verse number 10. But his, that probably is in this context referring to the king of the north, and the north in this context is Syria. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up and to his fortress, verse 11, and the king of the south. This is not the same one where we started, but it is the south in the fact that it is Egypt. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, 
and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. Boil it down, preacher. What is it? It's more fighting, more conflict between Egypt and Syria. From Daniel's perspective, this was predictive prophecy. From our perspective, it's history. Verse number 12. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. The same is true with the king of the north every time. It is always Syria, but it is not always the exact same king in every verse, in every context. If you really want to take a challenge, you could probably get almost any conservative commentary on the book of Daniel and look at the names that are called. How, don't, don't miss the big picture. How did Daniel know all this? How is it so historically accurate? He was inspired by the Holy Spirit and he heard it firsthand from what appears to be a heavenly being, if not an angel. Now in Daniel 11, verses 13 to 19, let's see the defeat. Verse 13, For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall Fail. The robbers are, I believe in the New King James, called violent men of thy people. Who's the thy? Robbers of thy people. That's Daniel's people. So the robbers of thy people are Jews who align themselves with the king of Syria to defeat the king of Egypt. But what happened when they did that, historically speaking, they brought more trouble upon themselves. Isn't that the way it is sometimes? Now, look at verses 15 and 16. So... The king of the north, the north is always Syria in this chapter anyway, shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south, that's always Egypt, shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But, verse 16, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. Surely you can see what the glorious land is. If you had to take a shot in the dark, what is the glorious land? That's the land of Palestine. Why is this chapter focused on the north and the south? Because as it was laid out geographically, Syria was immediately to the north and Egypt was immediately to the south and the glorious land was right between them. That's why this heavenly being, perhaps an angel, is revealing this truth as we read plainly, to Daniel. Now where it says they would be consumed, that's probably in reference to the Egyptian forces. But again, I would highly advise you, if you really want to see the in-depth sections of this chapter, read it and study it for yourself. Now, let's read verses 17 to 19. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Verse 18, after this shall he turn his face unto the isles or to the coastlands, and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf, shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Verse 19, then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. Boil all that down. Ultimately, this king of the north, which is Syria, failed in his attempt to conquer all the nations. It did not work out for this particular king of the north. Now, second, in Daniel 11, verses 20 through 35, let's see the corruption. We've seen the conflicts. Now let's see the corruption. In Daniel 11, verses 20 through 27, observe the deceit. Then... Verse 20, shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. Therefore, 
The one who took the place of the prior king of the north also failed and was ultimately murdered. Big shock there, right? Yeah. Now, verse 21, you'll recognize this man's name if you paid attention in Daniel 8. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. This vile person is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. If you recall from Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 9, he was the little horn. Not the same little horn at Daniel chapter 7, but the little horn of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9 dealing with the Grecian kingdom. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom. How? By flatteries. Look at verse 22. Just look at the language of this. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. That language is sort of similar to what we read in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. The prince of the covenant probably refers to the high priest of Judaism at the time that Antiochus IV Epiphanes came into the land of Palestine. Verse 23, And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Even historically speaking, this man was a very conniving person. He may not have been the strongest, but he was perhaps one of the smartest in the fact that he could manipulate people into getting his own way. Verse 24, he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, now observe that, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Antiochus IV Epiphanes is historically well known for desecrating religious places of all sorts. He did not care. Look at the language again. He shall do that which his fathers have not done. Most people, even in the political realm, if it is a religious place, they try to show some level of respect for that. Whether or not they believe in the God or not, other people consider it sacred or holy. Antiochus Epiphanes didn't care. He didn't even care when he walked into the temple at Jerusalem. He had already desecrated all these other places, so what was the big deal with the temple? He desecrated it just like he did everywhere else. He had no respect for any God really at any point in his life, though he may have for a little while. Verse 25. And he, this is still Antiochus IV Epiphanes, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south, that's still Egypt, though it's not the same one that we've read in previous verses, with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand for they shall forecast devices against him. I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. Verse 26, now look at this. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat, that's probably the king of the south, shall destroy him, and his, that's the king of the south's army, shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. The king of the south, which is Egypt, was betrayed from within. His own close associates betrayed him again. Do a little bit of research historically and you'll see how accurate this really is. Now, look at verse 27. I find this interesting. And both, that's Antiochus Epiphanes and the king of the south of Egypt, and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Don't you see that wicked men will say anything to get their way? The idea here is they're sitting at the same table and they're both just sitting telling lies back and forth. Doesn't that sound like what sometimes goes on in the political realm? Just see who can tell the biggest lie. But notice what this verse says. Look at it carefully toward the end. But it shall not prosper. You don't, there are no winners in the game of sinners. For yet the end, that's the end in this context, not the end of time, but this context shall be at the time appointed. God still rules these men. Nothing happens outside of God's appointed time. We may think that it does. We may speed things up. But really everything happens within the scope of God's time. Don't ever forget that. 
Now in Daniel 11, verses 28 to 35, let's see the damage. Verse 28. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. What do you think the holy covenant would be? If you were Daniel and you heard something about the holy covenant, what would you think? Wouldn't you think Judaism? Wouldn't you think the law of Moses? Doesn't that make sense? And his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Boiling it down, Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes ended up violating the temple in Jerusalem. Why? Because he could. Because nobody was powerful enough or conniving enough to stop him. And he set his mind on it. Verse 29. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south. That's Egypt. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Antiochus Epiphany failed in this assault against Egypt. Why? Because at the time appointed, God is the one who sets up kings. God is the one who removes kings. Don't ever forget that. Here's why. 4, verse 30, the ships of Kittim. I believe the New King James said Cyprus. When you really look at this context, it seems to be that the Roman armies came. And threw a little wrench in the machine. Even though Rome was not quite the world power. Really nowhere near the world power. That they would end up being. They were still a nation on this planet. For the ships of Kittim or Cyprus. Really Roman armies. Shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return. And have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return. And have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Now, what happens is Antiochus Epiphanes got mad at Rome and took it out on the Jews. Why? The simple answer is because he could. Because that's exactly what he felt like doing. Now, look at verse 31. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Surely you understand the sanctuary of strength would be the temple. The temple in Jerusalem. The temple of Judaism. And shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Read history. Antiochus Epiphanes stopped the biblically authorized sacrifices at the temple. Read Exodus 29, 38 to 42. Not that that's about Antiochus Epiphanes, but they had at least the morning and the evening sacrifices. He stopped it, even though that is in the context of the tabernacle. He sacrificed swine on the Lord's altar. What do you think that was? That is the abomination that maketh desolate. Even when you read in the New Testament, you can see when Jerusalem was encompassed with the abomination of desolation, which in that context was Roman armies, but it's the same principle. It's someone being totally disrespectful to the temple in Jerusalem. And he destroyed copies of Scripture. Why did he do all that? Because he could. Because he was conniving enough to get people to listen to him. Be careful who you put in positions of power. There's a lesson right there. Now, let's look at verses 32 through 40, 34 here. And keep this in mind. What happens to the faithful people? Just look at verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. That is, how did Antiochus Epiphanes get any motivation or get any people to listen to him? He didn't really go intimidate them. He was good with words. He corrupted people by flatteries. Even those Jews who were saying, look, yeah, we're Jews, but we want to be on the winning side no matter what. He could just corrupt them by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Even in hard times, God has always had faithful people. Always has and always will. Verse 33. And they that shall understand among the people shall instruct many, yet, hard time, they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. But what does that imply? All this persecution is going to come to an end. Verse 34. Now when they shall fall, they shall be, here's some King James language, hoping, that is helped, with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. The faithful always hold on. Even if it costs them their lives, what do God's faithful people do? 
They stay faithful. What's it going to be when hard times hit us? Even if it's physical persecution, are we going to hold faithful or are we going to be corrupted by flatteries? There's a lesson there, brethren. Now look at verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even, now look at the language, to the time of the end. That is not the same thing as the end of time. This is in the context of Antiochus IV Epiphanes and his persecution against the Jews. To take these verses and try to make them have a present day fulfillment is wrong. From Daniel's perspective, this was predictive prophecy. From our perspective, this is history. Look at it. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them why even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. Even those in the church today, we may undergo a fiery trial as even our Old Testament brethren did and as our New Testament brethren did in 1 Peter 4.12 and it may go on for as long as time continues. But what do we need to glean from this? Persecution will come even if it costs you your life. Don't turn on the Lord. Now third, in Daniel 11 verses 36 to 45, let's see the climax. In Daniel 11 verses 36 to 39, it is determined. Very plain. Verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Now, this is probably a summary statement in the context of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. However, some say that this shoots forward yet again, and begins to talk about things that would occur under the Roman regime. So it could be that till the indignation be accomplished has reference to the A.D. 70 destruction of Jerusalem. I don't know that that's exactly the case. My opinion would be this is still about Antiochus IV Epiphanes. But even if it applies to the A.D. 70 destruction of Jerusalem, what is it? It's history, and it is not something that's going to unravel or happen in our lifetime. Though Romans 15.4 is true, we can learn things from this. This has been fulfilled. We are not waiting on this to be fulfilled. Verse 37. Neither shall he, I believe this is about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. What's the point? When you reject the one true God from your mind, you don't know what you'll do. Their depravity knows no bounds. That's why we got to stay in the book. That's why we have to do what the one true God says because the alternative is terrible. But verse 38, in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, probably just a feigned honor, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Why would he honor this false god? Probably because he saw some advantage in it for himself. Because that's the way sorry people sometimes are. Thus, verse 39, shall he do in the, mo in the most strongholds with a strange, an unauthorized, a foreign god, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Now, that's pretty much a summary statement of Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Now, in verses 40 to 45, let's see his ultimate doom. Verse 40 is perhaps another recapitulation or an overview of things we've already studied. Verse 40, and at the time of the end. Listen to me carefully. The time of the end in this context is not the same thing as the end of time. This is in the context of everything that we've studied about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the little horn of Daniel 8 and verse 9. Okay? And at the time of the end 
Shall the king of the south, that's still Egypt, but it's not always the same individual, push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now look at verses 41 to 44. Look at this. Just look at how vile and crafty this individual was. He shall enter also into the glorious land, that's Palestine, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps, but... Tidings, that is, news out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore shall he go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to take away many. That's a bad individual. Historically speaking, it's been fulfilled. But look at verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end. And none shall help him. Could you imagine being the prophet Daniel and hearing that? How would you take that? Because trust me, even historically speaking, it's difficult to explain. Imagine the way poor old Daniel felt. But don't you see the truth of Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now, fourth, let's talk quickly about the challenge of Daniel 11. As if it hadn't been challenging enough. How do you take this chapter and try to give a congregation full of people something to go home and remember? That was definitely a challenge. So I'm going to give you four words. Number one, details. Consider the details of this chapter. Even though I didn't explain every minute detail, read it again. None but God could give details this specific. No one could give the details like this, this specifically, but God. No one but God could reveal future events with such precision. Are you aware that the Bible is the inspired one of God? Perhaps one of the greatest passages in all of the Bible really is in 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning actually in verse 19. We think we know verses 20 and 21, but verse 19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Look in that context. The inspired apostle Peter was an eyewitness. He's telling us we have something more sure than eyewitness testimony. What is it? It's the written New Testament. It is the written word of God. Knowing this first, going down into verse 20, but no, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Something better than even eyewitness testimony. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture was of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God, Daniel spake as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Ghost. Daniel didn't write his fallible memory. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record these details, and he recorded them exactly as they were to happen historically. How do you explain that? He was inspired. Word number two, disturbances. Is it really a big shock? To know that nations are fighting all around us. Are you really surprised when you cut on the news and somebody's fighting somebody? Are you really surprised? Listen, disturbances are going to take place here, there, and everywhere. Such is life. But let me tell you what's true. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation. It doesn't say an individual. It says a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. What do we need to be sure of? That we're right. That we're right according to the scriptures. And then we teach our neighbor. And then it's, we teach one, they teach one, and before you know it, the gospel spread like wildfire. Word number three, direction. 
Everything is in the hands of Almighty God, and we have to learn to trust His judgment. Psalm 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. When God determines that it's time for this nation to fall, it's right. But until that day comes, we need to keep on fighting. And we need to realize that God is the one who directs everyone's path. Word number four, diligence. Now, I got to admit, and I think you see, Daniel 11 is difficult. This is probably one of the most difficult chapters of the Bible, period. Especially if you try to lay it out in minute detail. But know this. There are some difficult things in the Bible. There are. But is the plan of salvation difficult? Is that really that hard to understand? Really? Daniel 11 and the plan of salvation are two totally different things. But you know what still must hold true with both of them? we got to do our very best, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, you know what you're about to hear? You're about to hear the same thing that you hear at the conclusion of every sermon. Do you want me to tell you what this really is? This is God's test of honesty. How honest are we going to be? Hear the truth. Acts 18, 8. Believe the truth. Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin. Acts 3, 19. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. Be baptized for the remission of sins. Be immersed in water. Covered by the water. Covered by Christ's blood. So that you can receive the forgiveness of your sins. Be raised up to walk in newness of life. Acts 2.38. Brethren, we got to be faithful. we got to deal with difficult chapters like Daniel 11. But not everything about being faithful is difficult to understand. It requires us to be honest too. Revelation 2.10. Wherever you are, come now. As together we stand and as we sing a song of encouragement.